Hi everybody, this is Donna Prosser with the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. Today we're here to talk about the impact of handoff communications on patient safety. And we're really excited to be joined by Dr. Annegret Hanawa. She's a professor of communication science at the University of Lugano, Switzerland. Welcome, Annegret. Nice to be here. Thank you, Donna. Now, Annegret, you are a communication scientist um, and you direct the only patient safety center in a communication science department at a university. You founded a global research center that combines communication science with patient safety research. And you've also delivered some groundbreaking research yourself over the last decade. So tell us, what, what does communication play in patient safety? What role does that play? Well, it's omnipresent, right? So it's the vehicle through which healthcare takes place. We need communication for everything that we do. Um, so in that sense, it really starts with history taking. It goes over diagnosis, treatment planning, treatment execution, post-treatment care, all the way up to discharge. And then of course, um, as a preventive function in those contexts. And then also when we look at the disclosure of adverse events, for example, we look at communication as an, an urgent or a safety critical competency there as well. So it's everywhere. And so the goal has become lately to optimize communication, as I said, both as a preventive function as well as um, for safe disclosure. So you mentioned prevent preventive communication. What interventions have been done so far? So quite a few. And as we're talking about handoffs today, of course, that's been a critical context in patient safety that we've been looking at. And um, so we've had multiple tools or frameworks that we've people have introduced. And of course, one of the most advertised one is uh, team steps. Um, and within that, of course, there's four skills embedded in that framework, and one of them being communication. Um, and among those communication skills, there's four different sets of techniques that have been introduced. And if you will have a slide that you can look at right now. So if we go up from the bottom, um, there's call outs, which is for communicating sort of important or critical information to other team members, such as, you know, airway status clear, breath sounds decreased on right, you know, blood pressure 96 over 62 and so forth. And um, then we have check back, which goes into closed loop communication. In my sense, it's the most, one of the most important things to look at, of course, it's about validating message receipt, right? So we're closing that circle of communication. And um, then one further up is a team communication tool, SBAR, which has been implemented um, all over the world. Um, SBAR stands for Situation Background Assessment and Recommendation, um, which is again for communicating critical information within the team though. So it's not a handoff tool per se. Um, and then we have, of course, the IPASS mnemonic, right, which is a linear way of standardizing and structuring communication um, in terms of structuring the content for handoffs. And that looks as uh, the I stands for illness severity, then patient summary, action list, so what's to do, uh, situation awareness with if then statements. And then for me, again, the most critical part is the synthesis part where, you know, the receiver um, repeats what was said, can ask questions, can confirm. Um, the action that needs to be taken place. So um, all that is, you know, kind of a linear assumption again, and that, you know, we kind of go through those processes, through those content categories to cover the basics. And it really, all these mnemonics serve kind of a recall or a reminder for the staff to make sure that all the important information gets covered. Um, so for that purpose, mnemonics serve quite well. There's lots of them. Um, so this is just one of the examples. But as I said, you know, IPASS has probably been tested most among the ones that have been available, although um, only few experimental studies have been done today to test the effects of IPASS on objective outcomes, particularly at adverse events. Um, sort of the, the golden key study that we've seen there, of course, in the New English England Journal of Medicine, uh, reported a 30 decrease in the rate of preventable adverse events, um, but only a two thirds of the investigated sites and what I'm missing is the effect sizes <laughs> haven't been reported in that study, but um, it's a start, but I still think that there is more research needed to be done to really look at patient safety outcomes as well. So why have preventive communication interventions not been successful up until now in solving our communication problems? Well, they have been successful to some extent, but I think there's a long way to go to um, look at larger effects of interventions. And I think one of the reasons why we haven't achieved as much as we could have is the fact that these mnemonic devices or these, these tools and frameworks that have been introduced, they've always been context specific and kind of problem focused. For example, the problem of handoffs or the problem of disclosure or the problem of 
uh, bad news delivery, right? So they've always been tied to particular contexts. And so there's also no one hand up mnemonic that is ideal for all hand up situations, right? So we've seen variability there as well. And there's no evidence that any one mnemonic is better than the other and in, in really affecting patient safety measures. Um, for me particularly, one of the biggest issues is that um, as we're teaching mnemonics instead of kind of the, the well, I'll talk about that later, that the shared sense-making skills is that we're cluttering medical students as nursing students' minds, right? Because they have to remember so many different mnemonics for different types of contexts that it could be really challenging for them to really grasp them and practice them as skills rather than something that's purely brain-driven. So for me, I think that there's, there's um, a path for development open there where we can look at something that applies to all care stages and all contexts and really strengthening that interpersonal sense-making process as, um, yeah, a, a resilience-enhancing skill set um, rather than just looking at fixing, you know, little context-specific issues like, a, like we're putting a prosthesis in a knee or something like that. So I think that's where, where we still have opportunity for growth. So what's the path forward there? How do we get to that place? Well, I think we first need to recognize the problem of the problem, right? And I think that there's a couple of pieces to that. First of all, we need to recognize that communication is not a synonym for information. I think still in the literature, oftentimes we see that being a metaphor. Like communication is just like a car that breaks down or a telephone that fails to operate. So I think that the first start is to recognize that communication is much more interactive than and just sending a message and making sure it arrives as it was intended, but it's a very dynamic interactive mechanism. Then also, of course, now with digitization, right? Um, that's increasing the problem because also with digitization, it, it rides on that assumption that communication is linear. <laughs> so I think we need to be careful that we're using digitization tools for um, enhancing that interpersonal sense-making process rather than just running on that, on that same problematic path that we've been we've been arguing on and then also recognizing that you know communication is not a problem it's a human condition right so so we communicate everywhere uh, and not very well <laughs> so we you know that's in communication science we research lots of different uh, contexts of communication problems you see workplace bullying you see intimate violence domestic violence you see so many issues you know that that we're researching and healthcare is just one, one other context where it gets dangerous, just like in the airline industry, because failures there threaten lives. Um, so I think that if we realize that um, the healthcare setting is very unique and that there's many people from different backgrounds coming with variable you know, linguistic and cognitive skills into one place and they have to interact quickly, many times a day, you know, under the, the pressure of uh, distracting noises, limited privacy, and oftentimes life and death situations. And that's just not a fertile ground for safe communication to just take place naturally. So I think that once we've recognized that problem of the problem, then we need to approach it um, with more of a fundament of that, as I said, that I, I like to call it an interpersonal sense-making process as a resilience enhancing safety feature, right? So that we're teaching or learning core competencies um, so if we standardize anything, it should be standardizing the skills to get us to a shared understanding and not so much the, the mnemonics. And I think the mnemonics are very helpful um, in that they, they do in situations that are under high pressure, make sure all the content gets covered. But beyond that, we need to make sure that as a fundament underneath those mnemonics, in a personal sense, making processes are, are resilient to failure. So you talked about core competencies and safe communication. What does that look like? So we've um, analyzed hundreds of patient safety cases to find an answer to that question, which is not that easy, but we came up with a pretty simple explanation. So what we found is that all patient safety events that we've looked at always reduce down to at least one of five communication things that go wrong. So those five, we've turned into competencies to prevent them from, from going wrong. So that's, that's how we approached it. And what we came up with is what we call safe communication um, as a context that will show up later on a slide, uh, Sasha. But to understand, stand, first of all, what, what's the, the fundament for that, for those skills to happen is the understanding of how communication takes place. And that's pretty simple. And many, 
learned this probably at a university <laughs> intro level of communication, but so what happens is we first um, get a thought in our mind that that's very complex, right? And our language is very abstract. So we have to uh, take a very complex thought and put it into nonverbal and verbal codes and cues uh, to convey that thought to someone else so that then it can reassemble like a puzzle in their head. Uh, and we can, we, we kind of conduct that process as long as it takes for us to really come out with the same puzzle that we share when we look at it. So that's the communication process. So we call that uh, encoding. So when I take that thought and I put it into nonverbal and verbal cues and send it to you, so to say, then you would decode that. That's decoding where you reassemble what I've disassembled <laughs> into hopefully the same puzzle. And then we engage in the third process that's transactional sense making, where we make sure that we've you know, done that process successfully. So that we're actually recreating that exact same puzzle that we had in our mind. So that's the three processes with you know through which communication takes place, and that that's an old an old knowledge that doesn't come from me, of course. So, but that as a fundament, um, we've found five different competencies. We've identified five different competencies that that go both into quantity as well as quality of communication, and um, and those three processes I just explained are embedded in each of them. So the first one, and we'll put that slide up now, and so you can follow through. Um, the SASHA framework, which summarizes as an acronym those five competencies. So the S stands for sufficiency, which is about the quantity of the informational content that's included, right? So many of the mnemonics that we've looked at um, actually move in that realm of making sure enough content is covered. So, but again, with those three processes, it's about conveying content, enough content, extracting enough content, and also exchanging a sufficient amount of information with each other to um, arrive at a shared understanding, right? So safe communication is about arriving at a shared understanding. So that's what sufficiency as the quantity factor looks at. And then the other four are accuracy, clarity, contextualization, and interpersonal adaptation that you see up on that slide. Um, accuracy, stands for, accuracy stands for not just conveying correct information or interpreting information correctly, but also to utilizing that transactional sense-making process for ensuring accurate information, right? So it's, a, it's sort of a validation process that we can utilize between us and um, to validate the accuracy of the communicated content. And then we have clarity, which is the next one, um, where it's about, of course, again, expressing and also interpreting both verbal and nonverbal messages clearly, so to avoid ambiguity in the way that we talk, but also to utilize our communication with each other to reduce uncertainty. Right? So it's an uncertainty reduction process. Um, and then we have contextualization, which in healthcare we found is the most frequent communication error that's happening. Is there's, you know, as I mentioned before, about the context of the healthcare setting being very complex. Like there's lots of contextual barriers um, that can hinder finding a shared understanding, right? So there are hierarchies, there's time pressure. There are possibly discrepant goals, right? A patient who's getting treated may not have the same treatment goal as the physician or the nurse, you know, dealing with that patient. So to what extent can we utilize our communication to neutralize these barriers so that we can actually achieve a shared understanding? And then the last one is the IA of Sasha, is interpersonal adaptation. Um, so we've seen a lot um, in, in the sense of non-verbally expressed needs. Um, to which we need to adapt as listeners or as co-participants in a communication for us to really attain a shared understanding. And if we don't, we're not going to arrive at a shared understanding, right? So that there's different, it can be emotional needs. We've talked about handing an issue to the patient, for example, that's a simplified version of the problem. But there's also linguistics needs, for example, so if, um, or cognitive processing speed differences or uh, differences in education or experience in, in the healthcare setting. That, can, um, that need to be adapted to so that we can actually attain a shared understanding with the other person. So these are the core competencies that um, we've kind of identified as fundamental resiliency enhancing processes, right, for improve, improving the quality and safety of care. Um, so that's, I think, you know, one of the ways in which we could move forward and help um, those mnemonics to achieve higher effect sizes because then the mnemonics remain what they are in a sense of helping a recall function, a reminder function, a focusing function in contexts that are under time pressure that are critical. Um, but at the same time, when those processes are trained well, then they can achieve much higher effects at the front line of care. 
So Anagret, last year you also had the experience of being a patient yourself. Can you tell us um, a little bit about that experience and how your Sasha framework could have improved the safety of handoffs? Well, it was, um, there's an article that's going to come out in August now that you feel free to post it um, on your network as well, um, in which I explain the frustration I had to experience being a communication scientist, having published for years um, on this topic and then witnessing how discouraging it is to be in the skin of a patient. Um, so, so what I saw is two things. First of all, um, there were multiple handoffs I experienced even within the first few hours I entered the emergency um, and then urgent care and then was delivered into, into my bedroom um, where I, I had a numb sensation of about 5% numb sensation in my arm. Uh, the first neurologist took it down as a tickling a sensation, passed that off to the next physician. I corrected that physician, said it was not a tickling sensation, it was a numbness I felt. And then the next morning there was another handoff where that tickling sensation was then handed off as pain. And again, I again had to correct them and make sure that in their records they would correct that uh, simple thing that I had corrected before and it still wasn't corrected in the records when I was discharged from the hospital later on. So um, I was just really um, discouraged to see how a, such a simple thing as, as a sensation in your arm, which is nothing compared to a much more complex scenario. I had a stroke, so that was much more complex to understand. Already there, the communication failed several times, and me as a patient could not correct it. Um, so that's the weakness I see in most of these handoff protocols, is that the communication is reduced to the caregivers, and the patient who's really supplying, also non-verbally, and verbally, of course, as much as you can, and a lot of, lots of valuable information to the safety of the care procedure is just bracketed out, right? Um, and then there was another issue where uh, they were following some sort of a weird SBAR procedure as a handoff, which was odd. Um, and uh, so they were so occupied. I don't know if, if it's because they realized I'm a communication scientist in the field or if they were, they were just trying to do it really well. I could tell I felt, felt humbled by that, right? But they were so into their mnemonic that they didn't um, communicate anymore. And they were just, nobody was making eye contact. Everyone was just looking at their, at their pen, pen pad and uh, taking down the notes. And, and they went like a linear process through the end. And then even the synthesis, which should be the part where communication takes place, was just another check in, on that list that they had to complete. And while they were going, going through this, I, I, there was a couple of things I wanted to correct, among other things, that tickling sensation. And I tried to say something and they shut me up. They, they raised their hand at me like, you know, stop sign and said, keep your thoughts to the end. We need to get through this, other, otherwise things get confusing. And then in the end, you're welcome to add what you have to add. So at the end, the problem was we're out of time, they had to leave. And second of all, they must have forgotten that as an as a acute stroke patient, my memory capacity was quite low. So I wouldn't even have been able to recall much of what I wanted to say. Um, so that's just, as I said before, that, that not understanding communication enough as an interpersonal dynamic sense-making process, but rather as that conduit metaphor of the, the, the phone line or like sending information through to the end and just leaving it up to best luck to get there um, is problematic. And um, so as I said before, I think that there's a lot we can improve there. And um, Talking about patient engagement or family um, activation, I think it's critically important that um, it's more than just allowing the patient to listen, but it's recognizing that the patient is part of the communication process. And if there is a shared understanding to be established, you can't bracket out one of the communicators. That's right. Absolutely. Well, and that, you know, that brings us to the, co the topic of patient-centered care, which we're, we're all supposed to be focusing on anyway. And if we don't have the patient at the center of care, then uh, clearly they will not have as good outcomes. So, well, thank you so much, Anagret. This has been such great information and we really appreciate you sharing your, your Sasha framework with us. Uh, we will uh, definitely be looking for your paper in August and be posting that on our website as well. Perfect. Thank you, Donna. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Anna Gret. Have a great day.